well, we have two observers and two theoreticians uh, speaking, so I'm one of the theoreticians. So I'm not going to talk about telescopes. I only have two pretty pictures in my presentation, uh, one of which you've seen already because Masha already showed it. Um, so instead, I'm going to try and uh, ask you to think about and imagine how stars and planets might actually form, okay? The first thing that we can say is that stars exist, okay? Because when we look up in the sky, we see things that are glowing. Uh, we've got a variety of ways of knowing that these things are very far away, so we know that they're stars, we know they're there, we know to some extent that planets exist, even with the naked eye, because we have the planets in the solar system. And for a long time there was a question over whether the solar system itself might be unique. Now, that would seem a bit bizarre of a question to me, but a lot of people had it. Now we know, as Masha mentioned, that, uh, that there are, we've observed about more than 5,000 uh, planets orbiting around other stars, okay? So pretty much everywhere that we look, we see a planet orbiting around a star. So it seems like planets are everywhere and stars are also everywhere. So it's reasonable um, to, to ask, where do they come from? How do they form? I'm going to show you a few cartoons. We're just going to talk about cartoons. I mean, there's beautiful mathematics and beautiful plasma physics behind all of this. I'm not going to force you to go through that. Um, although if you ask a question, I will. <laughs> um, you might remember that Masha showed a, a picture of a dark cloud against a very starry background. Okay, that, that's called a Bok globule. Um, and uh, it, it is just a, a region of space which has got a lot of fairly dense gas and dust, okay? So there's a lot of gas there, there's a bit of dust there, about 1% of, of it is made up of dust. Now, because it is dense, now when I say dense, by the way, if you talk to anybody who lives on Earth, they will not think that anything that I say is dense is actually dense, okay? So when I'm talking about something that's dense, I'm talking about something that is way, way more like a vacuum than anything that can be produced on Earth but on astrophysical length scales, it is pretty dense. So this thing is dense, so there's a lot of gravity associated with it because gravity comes from, ma from matter, from mass, and so that will begin to collapse under its own gravity, possibly. Okay, we need, to, we need to think about things, like we need to think about its temperature, we need to think about whether it's very turbulent, so is it being stirred up a lot, and then we also need to think about magnetic fields. But I, I will force you to think about magnetic fields, but more on that later. Um, as it collapses, it doesn't just, it, it initially kind of undergoes like spherical collapse. We're a theor I'm a theoretician, okay, so everything is a sphere. So we, we initially undergo spherical collapse, but because there's generally some kind of sense of rotation, it's very difficult to set up a, a, a system of gas without there being some net rotation. So as it collapses, it finds it hard to collapse in towards the rotation axis. So if it's rotating like that, it finds it hard to go that way, easy to go that way. So it forms a disk. At the center of that disk is where the star is going to form. So the reason the disk is there is because there's a big clump of material at the center, which is collapsed under the gravity. Uh, and this disk of material is now all made up of material which is in orbit around that forming star. It's not a star yet, there isn't nuclear fusion going on at the center of it, so it's called a protostar. Then for reasons to do with magnetic fields, we have what we call a bipolar outflow. So there's a basically, you have the disk of material, you have the star at the center, and then you have a jet going up that way and a jet going down that way. And these jets travel at about 400 kilometers a second, and they can be several light years long. Okay, so we know this, and how do we know it? We know it because we see them. So here is a picture of a star forming region, an actual star forming region. Up at the top, way up beyond the field of view, there are a bunch of very massive, very luminous stars, okay? And what they are doing is shining very brightly. So they're emitting a huge number of photons, a huge number of very high energy photons. And those high energy photons are coming along and they're hitting this brownish stuff here. That brownish stuff is the dense cloud gas that I was talking about, okay? These things are called molecular clouds. Typical temperatures anywhere between 10 Kelvin and 100 Kelvin or minus 260 Celsius to minus 170 Celsius, something like that. Um, so they're quite cold. And uh, we do have stars forming. How do I know that we have stars forming? I'm actually not tall enough. But at the top here, oh I am, um, there is a star forming in there. And the reason that we can identify this is because we see a jet going that way and a jet going this way. That's the bipolar outflows that we were talking about, okay? If you use your imagination, you can even see where this jet is hitting the interstellar medium that's, that's all here, and that you see a bow shock there. So it's this jet that's driving through the interstellar medium, driving out a bow shock as it does so. And they actually disrupt any other stars that are trying to form. They stir up those globules. And so they mean that you have this globule that's trying to form a star, and then a jet comes through and blows it away. 
So you, you have this kind of competition where massive stars can vaporize the material that other stars are trying to form from, and then even regular stars that aren't massive, they will form these jets, that, and that can disturb what happens to other stars. Even more interestingly, as you have this vaporization going on, that is driving a pressure wave into the molecular material, which makes that material more dense, which means it might form more stars. These are all pictures of disks. You might not be able to see that, but I'll try and point out one or two of them. They're, they're very special disks, they're called proplids, and the reason that they're very special disks is because they formed, uh, they're, so they're disks that are around a forming star. That forming star started forming in one of these molecular clouds, and then a nearby massive star vaporized the rest of the material, and now we can see the disk because we can see through it. So in the optical with our eyes, although our eyes don't have the resolution to actually see this, uh, we can actually see these disks. So we can just take a particular example, and um, this is just zooming in on one of those and you can see that we have this bar. This is the disk that we're looking at edge on. And then we can see this light glowing at the top and bottom. So we're not actually seeing directly the protostar. What's happening is the protostar is shining. The disk is flared, so it's not, it's not straight flat. It, you can see that it's kind of flaring as it goes out. And we're seeing reflected light off the opposite side of the disk. Uh, here, this is an absolutely face-on disk. So there is a protostar in the middle there. You wouldn't know it, but it is there. So this is viewed in, in the millimeter, so it's longer wavelengths than the optical. So we are looking through a lot of gas and dust and stuff like that here. Uh, we have these annoying lanes, dark lanes here. I call them annoying because everybody says, oh, look, it's planets. And it almost certainly is not planets. I will say that. And I'd say about half of the research community in the world will disagree with me, and half will acknowledge that I have a point. Because if they are planets, we have no idea how planets form because this disk is only probably 50,000 years old, and uh, the standard models for planet formation would take five million to 15 million years before you should get these lanes. Now, by five million to 15 million years, we know these are wrong anyway, because the disks themselves have vanished by the time the this, this system is five million to 15 million years old, okay? So even the disks don't last that long. So we know we've got a problem with planet formation. Okay, so we have uh, the cartoon model of star formation, we look at the real world and we say this is very complicated. But then when we use ALMA uh, to look in very close at what's going on, we see that although it is very complicated, we do have disks. They are really beautiful disks. We might need to argue with ourselves about how those disks form exactly and how they become so beautiful, but they are there and they are beautiful. So let's see what happens now. At the moment, there is a protostar at the center of this. There is not a star. That means that the protostar has not got enough matter on it. Not enough material has fallen onto it. Not enough material has accreted onto it yet to uh, raise the pressure and density at the center of the star to drive nuclear fusion, okay? So we need to get material from the disk onto the star. And you say, well, this is great, right? We've got a big disk of material there. It's obviously dense because we can see it. Um, so, you know, it, it's, got to, it's, it's got to have a lot of stuff in there. And indeed, it does have a lot of stuff in there. Um, there is a problem. And the problem is that if you do any theoretical study of a disk that is like this, okay, so this is a disk of gas. It's in what we call Keplerian orbit, which means that it's just, you know, in its stable orbit around the star. And you say, is anything going to fall onto the star? And the answer is no. The disk is just going to stay there and nothing will fall onto the star. That system, if it's just gas and dust orbiting around a protostar, it will stay like that forever. And you can kick that disk and it'll kind of get a bit upset and then it'll settle back down to the way it was. You can do all sorts of things to it, but you cannot make it move material onto the star. And the reason really is um, this. So this is. Um, somebody, I don't know who, uh, but it's on YouTube. They obviously liked their pirouette. And you can see that as she's doing her pirouette, she's pulling in her arms, and we all know this, as the arms come in, the rate of uh, her rotation goes up, okay? That's all down to conservation of angular momentum. And this is the problem that we have with the disk of material. The disk of material is orbiting around the, around the star. I'll do it so you can actually see it. Uh, in order to get in onto the star, it has to move in towards the center of the rotation, just like the skater's arms were moving in towards the center of rotation. As it does so, it'll begin to orbit more quickly. 
Now, we all know that if you have something orbiting quickly, so think of being in a car going rapidly around a corner, you tend to get flung outwards pretty quickly in comparison to a car going slowly around a corner. Exactly the same thing will happen with this material that is trying to move in onto the star. And it will happen to such an extent that the, that force that is pushing the material out, the centrifugal force, um, exceeds that of gravity, okay? So it will be able to withstand gravity, and that means no stars exist, which is a problem because we can look up in the sky and they're there, okay? So there is a solution, and the solution resides in magnetic fields, okay? So and, and this is where I start to get excited. So here's a simulation that we ran uh, of uh, one quarter of one of these disks, okay? We've done it properly, so it's not just like, it's one quarter, but you can imagine that there are three other quarters around here. It's, I don't know, I still don't know where to go. It's uh, more dense in here, so the red is higher density, and then as you come out, it goes bluer, and ev eventually you can actually see through it, and that's where there, there's lower density, okay? So we started off with a fairly smooth distribution of density, and then we let the thing go, and we didn't have a smooth distribution of density. You may notice that we started out with material out here, and then and towards the end, there's much less material out here. We're able to see through it. So that means some of that material has moved in towards the star, okay? So it has lost angular momentum, which is great, okay? And the reason that it lost the angular momentum was because we have this turbulent disk, and this disk becomes turbulent only because of the presence of magnetic fields. We can all sigh, uh, you know, let a great sigh of relief and think, grand, we've got star formation sorted. but we don't now have planet formation sorted because we now have a very turbulent disk, okay? If planets form roughly in the same way as stars, that is, there's a clump of material in the disk now, which is trying to collapse under its own gravity, then our solution to getting stars to form is to stir up that disk like crazy, which means that this lump of material in the disk that is trying to collapse to form a planet keeps on getting stirred up, and then we can't form the planet. Even if we were able to keep the disk uh, non-turbulent, and if we could somehow magically come up with a way of forming a star even though uh, it's non-turbulent, we still don't know how planets form, right? Even in a uniform disk where we're not stirring it up all the time or anything like that, we still don't know how planets form. Now, the reason that I'm putting forward such a depressing image of what we know about uh, star and planet formation is because this is the thing that's really interesting. I mean, this is what's exciting. We don't know how it works. We have all sorts of ideas. There are very interesting things. You can do interesting things like with pebble accretion. There's things called a streaming instability. There's all these kind of really, really interesting topics, but we don't know. We don't know whether the conditions exist in these disks to allow planets to form. And we know that for all these different ideas that we have, we need quite specific conditions to exist. Because we've got so many problems, we start drawing more and more complicated cartoons. Okay, so we went from that nice 1970s style cartoon of star formation where it looked like everything was fine and we had planets and all this kind of thing to this. Do you remember the bipolar outflows that we talked about? So what we say is, okay, no idea how those form unless there are magnetic fields. So why don't we come up with a way of using magnetic fields to drive those jets and a way of stopping the magnetic fields from um, destabilizing the disk. And then the jets maybe can take away the angular momentum that we need to get rid of in order to allow material to fall onto the disk, onto the star, okay? Now, because the disks are very cold, then we say that they don't interact with the magnetic fields. But honestly, at this point, nobody knows what they're talking about. Uh, I spent three weeks at conferences about a month ago, and that was the conclusion from the conferences, is that we don't know because we don't have the observations yet. So we are waiting for people like Masha who isn't a planet formation person, but anybody who will use telescopes and look at that data and understands how to manage the data, um, to come up with better observations to tell us more about how these disks behave. And the uh, ALMA is doing a great job on that. Um, and also the JWS, the James Webb Space Telescope, is, is doing a great job on it. But in the end, this is the kind of thing we have to explain. We have a galaxy here. It is obviously full of stars. You can see that there are dark lanes in that galaxy. They're the molecular clouds from which stars form. And then we know that there are planets there. But we don't yet know. We have a lot of ideas, but at the moment they're all cartoons, and we don't yet know what we're doing with, with this. But we're making progress, slowly. That's all I have to say. Thanks.
I was just curious, you know, in one of the earlier photographs, you showed that there's a lot of these clouds in the universe, and they're quite common, yeah. um, commonly seen. I was just curious then, is there something that triggers the collapse, or is it just a matter, like, is it just something that... So that's a, re that's a really good question. Um, so the clouds themselves uh, are turbulent, um, and we know this because we can, we can observe the turbulence. Um, because they're turbulent, this is another area that I, that I work in, so I'm trying to stop myself from going into this, but it's, it's really nice. Because they're turbulent, they create some regions that are denser than other regions, as you can imagine if you're stirring it up. And those regions are the regions that will then collapse. So in some sense, that is triggered because you've taken the, the, the molecular cloud and you've compressed it a bit. You also, we have evidence, um, it's not the most convincing evidence, but at the same time it is evidence, uh, that if you have, say, a supernova going off um, near a molecular cloud, then as the blast wave passes through the molecular cloud, you can see triggered star formation move through the cloud. And we measure this by looking at the ages of stellar systems on one side of the molecular cloud compared to the ages on, uh, as you move through the cloud. And we find that as you move through the cloud, they get younger um, because the blast wave took a long time to go through the cloud. So yes, they're triggered. They can be triggered. Um, they have to be triggered in some sense, but it is an instability. So once you, <clears throat> it's a bit like if you have if you balance a, a, the, a pencil on the on its tip. You know, I mean, in principle you can do that, but you only need to touch it a little bit and it'll it'll fall. So in the same way, there's lots of systems that you have. They are unstable. You just need even a small perturbation or a small kick uh, in order to get them to collapse. Is the rate of star formation is it is it slowing down? You know, is that as the universe ages, or does it start uh, Yes, right. is the short answer to that. Um, uh, but there are still, uh, oh, there are still. Um, we, we still observe uh, starburst galaxies. Uh, so these are galaxies that are undergoing very rapid star formation. Um, in the Milky Way, uh, it's what, it's about one star a year um, is being formed. I mean, that's obviously, it's not one star a year, but like on, on average, it's one star a year. Um, and that is lower than it would have been in the past. Um, but uh, in general, yes, we would expect that the star formation will gradually slow. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Okay.